Amen. Um, I, I'm going to remember this week, teenagers, we love you. Get out of here. <laughs> You're going to head out with JV in the back for your time together, but we really appreciate the fact that you worship and sing with us. Um, it is, there is something really intentional about, intentional about worshiping intergenerationally, and so we're excited to be here together. Uh, we are thankful to be in the house of the Lord. If you are new or are visiting with us, my name is Beth. I'm part of the team here at Crossroads. If you're watching with us online, thank you for being part of the family as well today. Before we launch into our message, I just want to take just a minute to celebrate. One of the reasons we come together formally as believers is to celebrate celebrate his goodness, to celebrate that he is at work in our life. And one of the things that we can celebrate is we have in 2023 been working really hard to set the stage for what it means to be a spiritual family. We just finished a whole sermon series on this idea that biological ties are, what not, are, are not what determines a spiritual family. A spiritual family is brothers and sisters who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior coming together to walk out this life in unity with purpose. And so it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter what our family of origin looks like. We can find hope and healing in the family. And we've been walking that out by beginning to practice what we call spiritual families, groups of people who are committed to doing life together and doing life with a specific kingdom purpose in mind. And it's been really fun to watch people begin to lean into that. Just this week, we were able to, to celebrate together one spiritual family who made it a point all together to throw out the invitation to go and see one person in the group, to go and see her son's game this, week, this last week. And they did it. They went and they cheered him on and they enjoyed fellowship and connection together. We had one group who met here last Thursday. They had their time together. And, and as we were wrapping up worship rehearsal in here, one of them comes running in and she says to me, Beth, you got to see this. And we go out and we see two of them playing with uh, battery cars out in this little dirt parking lot, having a blast. Faith, family, people who are committed to connecting together, who are walking this thing out. We're learning, we're not gonna get it right, but I wanna celebrate that God is at work and there are people who are willing to lean in. And so thank you so much. If you are interested in being part of a spiritual family, please come and find me. We would love to connect with you and help you because each family has its distinct, unique kingdom purpose. For some, it's learning to listen to the voice of God. For some, it's about rebuilding community that was lost. For some, it's about turning attention outward into the community. We want to celebrate that and remind ourselves that we're committed to that journey because we are practicing what the early church looked like. We are practicing what it means to be honest with the fact that we all need a place to belong and we all need to have a right understanding of the Lord. If you are new, if you're visiting with us, I want to explain something for just a moment because this is not something that I have done all throughout my preaching journey. But within the last year, the Lord has really been working on my heart and what it means to be honest with where I am, what it means to be honest with the, the uh, body of Christ that has been entrusted into my care, to see this as holy ground, to see this space as holy ground, to see the lives of individual believers as holy space where the Lord is at work. And so he's been challenging me to lay down some of the things that have bound me up and tied me down in the past. And he's been challenging me to see that as holy ground. And so I'm barefoot this morning, not because I think it's cool, not because I just randomly want to be different. This is an act of me learning what it means to follow his will for my life instead of my own to seek after him and to be honest in times in my life where I've really tried to make it all about how I look, to make it all about how I appear. Do I appear smart enough? Do I appear put together enough? Or am I gonna lay that down and trust that the person who actually has this thing, has the church, has this world, is God and God alone? But it takes being honest. 
And so I thought it would be fun today to have a conversation about honesty, about lying. That sounds fun, right? That'd be great. Let's dive in. I was listening to a podcast this week in which the pastor uses this phrase, and it caught me off guard. In fact, I had to pause the podcast and write it down. If you don't tell the truth, you can't change. If you don't tell the truth, you can't change. And I realized as I was writing that down and processing that, that he's making a very specific point. He's making the point that it's not just about not lying, it's about being honest. I cannot lie about the fact that I really love peanut butter M&Ms. I cannot lie about the fact that I can eat a whole bag in one sitting if someone will let me. I cannot lie about that. But am I being honest in the truth that there are some things in my life that are holding me captive? See, there are a lot more serious things in life than peanut butter M&Ms. I can lie, I cannot lie about addictions that have held me captive. I can be honest, I can say, yeah, that's something that's tripped me up and held me down. But am I being honest with the fact that that thing is actually tearing me apart? Am I being honest in the reality that I'm hurting the world around me? There's a very distinct difference between simply not lying and being honest. And he goes on to make the point that the person that we all lie to the most, the person that we are all less honest with the most, is actually ourselves. We pad our Christianity with all sorts of lies. And what I mean by that is not necessarily things that aren't true, but things in which we say them not fully believing them to be true. I can say all day long that I am a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. But do I actually believe it? Belief in the New Testament is to act as if it is so. Meaning, is it here or does the fact that I'm a child of God actually play out in the way that I live? Because if that's not true, if I'm not being honest with myself, then I'm in bondage. I'm playing the game of how I look. I'm playing the game of trying to earn my identity through work. I am playing the game through constantly questioning whether or not God is present with me. Am I being honest? Alex has said up here from the front several times, he said, sometimes we sing songs because we know they are true. Other times we sing songs until we know that they are true. And he's right. But the only way that we can do that is if we're honest with ourselves that there are some things where we haven't yet gotten to the part where we can determine that they're true. Admitting that we don't actually believe them. See, one of the biggest lies that we've bought into is that we think we know God. We think we know enough about him. But see, how we think about God affects everything. And everything is a theological term for all the stuff. How I think about God affects everything. And what I think about him really leaks out subconsciously, even if I admit it or not. I can say I know that he loves me, but without realizing it, I can go to great lengths to avoid spending time with him. Because down underneath it all, okay, yeah, he might love me, but I'm not actually sure he likes me. And so instead of being honest with that reality of saying, I, I don't know if God likes me. I don't know if he looks at me and sees me with delight. I don't know if he looks at me and says, I have a plan and a purpose for your life. That's being honest. 
but instead we pat it. I'm a child of God. What if there was space? What if there was opportunity for us to be honest so that we can stop self-sabotaging ourselves? We talk all the time Sunday morning about this being a space where we can come together and turn our eyes upward to the Father. That we are called as believers to come together to focus on Him, the Creator, and the King. And yes, that's absolutely true. And why? Because most of us need a constant, weekly, daily reminder of who he is. And we need a constant, weekly, daily reminder that who I have created him to be is not necessarily the real God. Because I can say he's just. I can say he's good. I can say he forgives. And yet... Underneath it all, there can be something inside of me that lives with such fear that turns all of my attention to somehow trying to earn my worth and value so that I can just be sure. We're lying. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Aren't you glad that we're having this conversation? I am. It's not comfortable, but it's real. It's real to say, hey, can I be honest with where I'm at? Right now, can we take stock of where we are, that all of us in our Christian journey at one point or another have needed help into rewriting the narrative of God and who he is within our own lives? Because if we're not honest about what we know to be true about God, at the very least, we are living a constant game of guess who. You know the game where you sit across from someone and you got the little tiles and you lift them up and you, the other person has a person they've picked and you have a person you've picked and you're trying to guess theirs? It's like we're doing that with God. Are you wearing a hat? Are you wearing glasses? Are you good? Are you just? My kids had the game Guess Who growing up. It was the junior version of the game and my son loved it. And he wanted to play with me a hundred times a day if I would have let him. And I have to tell you something. Guess who is fun twice? About your 26th time, it's much less fun. And yet we do that with God. We play these guessing games with God because somehow that feels easier than being honest with myself about the fact that who I have known him to be, my background, the pain of my past has dictated who I thought he was. And so I'll just keep playing guess who until I get tired and give up on faith. And I'm not even doing it consciously. But God invites us into something different. Because God can be known. He can be known as much in our humanness we can know and understand. He doesn't want to play guess who with us. But he needs us to be honest about where we are so that we can move forward. So that we can fully live. And live life abundant. Now, when I say abundant, I don't mean that everything is going to be perfect and that I'm going to have tons of money and I'm going to have the career I want and get everything I've ever dreamed of. We just got through a a two-week series on wilderness where we talked about God showing up in the dark and difficult times. When we talk about abundance, we mean living with the reality of Jesus Christ at work in our lives day in and day out, which means that we can hold joy in the good and the bad. It means that we can confront the things that come at us with his grace. It means we can know truth, both now and for eternity. It starts with him, always. So what we do here on Sunday morning, it's an adventure. It's an exploration into the character of God, discovering all that we can to be free. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, so Christ has really set us free. Now make sure that you stay free 
And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Jesus Christ came to set us free. Not sort of free, not kind of free, but really and truly free. Free from all the things that have determined our reality and our worth up to that point. Free from the sin that weighs us down. Free to live abundant with him. But it starts with being honest that we haven't been living that way. That life gets in the way. I've had a few people ask me over the last couple weeks if I can share some stories from our trip to Scotland and Ireland. It was a fun time. If you're new or visiting with us, uh, my husband and I had a trip that was slated in 2020, and um, 2020 happened, and so that didn't get to happen. And so we got to go this year. We had saved up. We were able to go. Alex came with us. We had a wonderful time being able to see what's, what Scotland and Ireland was like. And we made our way from Edinburgh all the way down through Scotland, Northern Ireland, into the Republic to the southwest corner. And during our time in that southwest corner, we found ourselves in an abbey. We were on this drive, and we found this beautiful place where the, it was relatively taken, um, not destroyed by the elements. It was in good shape. You could go, you could walk around, you could walk through the graveyard, you could see how they lived and what life was like for them. But the reason we were drawn there is because Jeff had found that in the middle of this courtyard was said to be a tree that was between 400 and 700 years old. This is a tree that's older than our country has been around. And we're like, that sounds awesome. Yes, let's do that. So we parked the car and we walked through this wooded area and we showed up to the abbey and it was just as cool as we thought it was going to be. And as we rounded the corner into the courtyard of the abbey, we stopped. It took our breath away because in the middle of this courtyard was this tree. And the tree, the, the bark of it wound in circles around and it was full of life and I had to hug it. It was so cool. Here was something that had stood the test of time. And it made me pause, it made me reflect what is it about this tree that has allowed it to live so long? And I realized, now I am not an ecologist, I, I'm not an arborist, I don't study trees, but we could see from our surroundings that this tree was perfectly positioned in such a way that it was exposed enough to the elements that it was forced to dig its roots down deep. It got the nutrients. It got the sun that it wanted. However, being in this open air courtyard meant that it was protected enough from the extremities of the elements to help it survive and help it thrive. And how much of our Christian faith is about learning that God will walk with us when we're exposed to the elements. He will pat us and protect us when life is weighing us down. And we get the opportunity to dig our roots deep so that we can fully live, that we can be alive. I'm pretty sure I've never seen anything more alive than this tree. And yet God has promised that he loves us more than the trees and the animals. We are his. We are his kids. And so we're going to be diving into a book. Uh, if you are new or visiting with us, we, we go back and forth with our sermon series. Sometimes we will zoom out and look thematically at the narrative of Scripture all the way to see the truth of salvation and things like worship all the way through the narrative of Scripture. And sometimes we will zoom in and we will focus on one book and we will dive in and we will see all that there is to see there because we are called to do that as Bible readers, to zoom out and to zoom in to make sure that what we're seeing remains consistent with all of Scripture. And so we're at a point in our journey where we are going to zoom, zoom in. And we're going to zoom in on a book that addresses all of this. It addresses life, life abundantly. It addresses what it means to be honest with ourselves and our journey. It addresses what it means to know and understand the character of God. We're going to be in the book of Romans. It's a theologically hard book. 
And if you're like me, oftentimes in my Christian journey, I'm like, I also avoid that one because it's hard. Oh, but man, it's so good. It's so good when we begin to dive in to see that Paul is making the point, for I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, Jews first and also Gentiles. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Zoe. And that original word means literally full and abundant life. Fully alive. Not subpar existence, but real, authentic life. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting really tired of a world that has continued to give me something fake. It has continued to paint a picture that isn't real, that has left me hollow and broken, we need, this world needs something real. And Romans touches right on that. So that's where we're going to be, zooming in, setting up camp in one of the most influential books in history. And as I was studying, I came across the idea that even scholars and historians who don't believe in God cannot help but admit that, impact, uh, that Romans has had an impact on world history in ways few other books has. Because Romans was the catalyst for people like Augustine, Martin Luther, Karl Barth, to encounter the living God, where things like the Protestant Reformation emerged, the grounding of theology. It's one of the most influential when we take out this idea of, of our Christian faith and just look at it from a world perspective, this has been one of the most influential books in history. But let's be honest, it's hard to read. For in it, we encounter some, not all, but some of Paul's most deepest and profound theology. He's really cutting to the meat and the bone of what's there. Romans is notoriously known to be a complicated, theologically divisive, difficult to wade through book. Does that sound fun? It's going to be good. And all of these descriptors can be the case as believers attempt to, to decipher what Paul is saying. But at its heart, Romans is a letter expressing his heart to a people that he loves to Jews and Gentiles living tenuously together in Rome. And as such, it's worth exploring. And thankfully, the underlining message is one of life found in the good news of Jesus. Life that unites instead of divides, that motivates instead of subdues, that corrects instead of caters. All throughout the book is this theme of life. What we are going to be encountering, what we're going to be unpacking is a theology of life centered on unity between the Jews and the Gentiles. And I want to stop here for just a second. The Protestant Reformation brought about a lot of really great things, and it brought about this idea that we can individually have a relationship and connection to the Father. However, the original audience was to a people, was to a corporate group Paul was addressing something corporately amongst those who followed Jesus. So we have to hold that as we read. We talk about eternal life through salvation by faith from the wages of sin. We're going to talk about life for every individual and a corporate people. We're going to talk about what it means to actively live out a life of faith. And we're going to talk about what it means to live a life unashamed of the gospel that has changed humanity. To live unashamed. I don't know about you, but I carry around a lot more shame than I would ever care to admit. And so we're going to dive in. I want to set the stage for you 
as we begin this journey together. I'm gonna give you a little Bible trivia in case you ever decide you wanna play a Bible trivia game, but it helps us as Bible readers to know the structure and the format in which the Bible is written. So the Old Testament and the New Testament are canonized, which is a fancy word for put together, in a certain way. The Old Testament begins with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, which is the law, what it means to find salvation in Christ for the Old Testament people, or in God through the Old Testament people. And then you encounter the history, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, the history of God's people as they begin to walk that out. Then you come across the letters, Psalms, Proverbs, these beautiful poetic pieces, and then you come to the prophets. Ezekiel, Hosea, Daniel, Habakkuk, who are prophetically speaking of what is to come. They're written in these larger genre chunks to help us as Bible readers. Guess what? The New Testament does the same thing. They mirror each other to help us understand the greater peace. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a story of Jesus who came to fulfill the law, to usher in a new way of living. The book of Acts, the history of the early church, the letters written to the early church to affirm, to encourage, and then Revelation, the book of prophecy, to point to what is to come. And Romans comes at the start of those letter chunks, and those letter chunks are written and are grouped together by the author. You have 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, you have 1st and 2nd Peter, and then you have all of Paul's letters, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, all of his prison letters. And fun fact, They are put together in the New Testament in order of which of his letters is longest. So Romans is Paul's longest letter. In it, he addresses stuff that is so profound and so good for us. And like all letters, his letter follows the basic format of what we see when we encounter first century or early church letters. There's an identification of the author and his affiliation. There's an identification of the readers There's thanksgiving, verses 8 through 15, and then there's the theme of the whole letter. That's how it kicks off. It follows that format. I love it. He's being so to the point. Here's who I am. Here's who I follow. Here's why I'm thankful for you. Here's who I need to listen to this, and here's my point. Can you imagine if we all were that good at speaking and articulating things to one another? If we just said it honestly? Hey, um... Uh, I'm Beth, and um, well, I mean, if it's not too much trouble, if you can take out the trash, that would be great. We hem and haw around so many things in life, but Paul is being so honest, so real, and he identifies himself and his affiliation right out the gate. So we're going to read that together. We're going to go to the book of Romans. If you do not own a Bible, there are free Bibles, both in English and in Spanish, all throughout this room. Please take one. Make it your own. It's in the little cubbies in the seats around you. Pull out your phone app, whatever you have, because I'm not going to put it up here. I want us to practice as Bible readers getting into the Word. So we're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. This letter is from Paul a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets and his holy scriptures. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him and bringing glory to his name. Right away, out the gate, this is who I am, this is what I'm about. I am Paul, I am a slave, doulas, one who serves another, one who intentionally places himself in the service of another who is greater than me. And I've come to preach the good news. Now, good news, that word, the original word is taken from the Old Testament. It's Hebrew equivalent, get this, is the victory of God that he wins for his people. What a cool message. 
As Christians, we believe in the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. As Christians, we believe that Jesus brought reconciliation between us and the Father, between us and each other. But Paul's making it clear. He's making it plain right out the gate. It doesn't end there because three days later, he rose from the dead. He conquered death and the grave, and he is victorious. That's the good news of the gospel. And Paul's saying, that's what I'm doing. And you can insert that right in there. I am Paul, an apostle sent out to preach God's victory for his people. What an encouraging note. And he's he's talking to people who would understand out the gate. He's affiliating Jesus with David, knowing that the Jewish people know that Jesus would come, the Messiah would come through David's line. He immediately addresses the Trinity, which is not a word you find in Scripture. It's a word we have created to talk about this beautiful three-in-one nature of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that we, when we read Scripture, we can't encounter one without the other. And out the gate, Paul is saying just that. He was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. Try reading Scripture and pulling out one of the Trinity away from the others. You can't do it. God is one. God is present. God is divine. And he's making that point right away. And he's making it very clear who Christ is and the premise from which he operates as an apostle. And then he identifies his readers, verses 6 and 7. And you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I am writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be his own holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and give you peace. Who is he talking to? He's talking to people who already know him and him being God. He is talking to believers who love God and are walking that out, out, who are already within the household of faith. See, what we know to be true from Acts chapter 2 is that the Holy Spirit came in the upper room, the tongues of fire came to rest on the disciples, and they began to preach in all sorts of different languages. And right away, out the gate, the gospel begins to spread, and house churches begin to pop up all over the Roman Empire. Jesus came at just the right time in history. No other time in the first century world could news have spread as fast as it did because the culture had been established for information to travel. So we know that really early on, there were already house churches of Christian believers who had popped up in Rome. So Paul is talking to those Christian believers. We also know that Paul is at his heart an apostle. He said it the first time. His ultimate goal for those of us who are somewhat familiar with the book of Romans or with the history of Paul in Acts, often focus on the fact that Paul is trying to get to Rome. All of the end of Acts is him trying to to get there and him being imprisoned, taken to Rome, and ultimately dying in Rome. But that was not Paul's end goal. See, Rome already had Christian believers in it. Paul's end goal was to take the gospel to the unreached people groups in Spain. You can't take the apostolic out of the apostle. He wanted to go where the gospel had not yet been heard. And he wanted Rome to be a base through which he could do that, through which he could operate and reach those people with the good news of Jesus. But he's writing a letter to a people who who believe but are already divided. See, in AD 49, Emperor Claudius issued a decree that expelled all Jewish people from the city of Rome. That included Jewish Christians. So he expelled them out of the city. And as he did so, it left opportunity for all the Gentile, non-Jewish, ethnically, believers to rise up and take the head of the Christian community within the city of Rome. And we also know through history that that decree eventually dissipated. It didn't actually last very long. But when they were dispelled out into the Roman Empire, that's when we see Paul meeting people like Priscilla and Aquila and others who are Roman. And then when the decree dissipates, those people then go back, those Jewish believers, to Rome. And what do we have right away, out the gate, an issue. 
between Gentile Christians who don't like the fact that Jewish Christians are coming back in and telling them what to do, and Jewish Christians who are coming in and saying, okay, you may believe in Jesus, but you are not living according to our Jewish law. And already within a short period of time, there is this schism, this social and cultural divide between these people. These are the people Paul's writing to. This is the cultural framework within which he is operating. This schism of disgruntled believers. And Paul addresses what's really worth fighting for. What parts of culture, what parts of the Christian faith are most important? What do we hold on to and what do we let go of? If we are going to be fully alive in this world, there are some things that we have to settle into our spirits. There are some things we have to let go of so that we don't live anxiously, wondering whether or not we're doing things correctly. There is this sense of going back to the beginning and saying, are we being honest with where we are in our journey to say that there are some things from our past that we have drudged into our present. Whether that's culture, whether that's my my church history past. One of the reasons that the book of Romans, I think, is so deep is because it is so deeply personal. Nobody knows the battle of culture and past with the present reality of faith than Paul. Growing up in a deeply entrenched Jewish culture, studying under the famous Gamamiel, who was one of the most famous Jewish scholars of the day, Paul grew up angry. He grew up knowledgeable. He grew up so dead set on the Jewish faith. He had a passion and conviction that God radically changed when he confronted him on the road to Damascus. And here Paul is looking at people who are trying to figure out how to live this thing out, what parts of Judaism are worth holding on to, what parts are worth letting go of, and there is nothing more deeply personal than his wrestle with the very same thing. The reason why Romans is such a powerful piece of writing and why it has been so influential in Christian history are one and the same. We see Paul the Jew wrestling with the implications of his own and his convert's experience of grace, and Paul the Christian wrestling with the implications of his Jewish heritage. Oh, don't we all do that? Don't we pull our past into our present? How many of us have been living and doing things simply because we were told that's what we were supposed to do instead of asking the questions of God the Father of how do you want me to live? What convictions do you want me to hold? We see in Romans Paul operating at the interface between Judaism and Christianity, the transition from one to the other in the process of being worked out. Paul had to let go of a lot of things, of his past and his heritage and his upbringing. And he is being raw and he is being authentic and he is being honest throughout the whole book of Romans as he brings to the table a theology that's based on God and not on our cultural past or current surroundings. And he invites us as readers to do the same. See, change can't happen unless we're honest with ourselves. The theme of the whole letter is that we can live free. I am not ashamed of the gospel of God. And we're going to begin to talk more about that next week. We're going to unpack those theme verses, verses 16 and 17. But today was about setting the stage, about providing opportunity for us to be honest with where we are. Honest with how we've historically seen God, honest with our faith journey, and to be invited into a new way of living. The stage is is set to allow God to speak, and so we're going to go back into a time of singing. We have one more song that we're going to sing together this morning, but we're going to do something that we have been doing as Christians throughout the, the, the centuries. That is, we're going to take communion together. As believers in Christ, We are called to remember what God has done for us 
and who he is, who he really is, and what he is inviting us into. So as we sing, we invite you around the room. We have communion stations set up. There are two here in the front. There are two in the back. The gluten-free are in the back if that's what you need. If you are in the nursing mom's room, there is a station set up in there as well. We want to invite you to come and partake. All we ask is that you claim Jesus as Lord and Savior. That means something very significant to us. If you don't claim him as Lord and Savior, please just refrain and take this time to hear the song and to listen. We do this through intinction. We take the bread and we dip it into the juice and then we take it back to our seats. But here's what I would like to do a little bit differently this time. As we sing, as we take communion, I want to invite us into the same thing that Paul is inviting his readers into. Can we, over the next 12 weeks, commit to being honest with where we are? To be honest with the things that have held us back. Honest with what we know to be true. Because if we can't tell the truth, we can't change. And change is part of the Christian journey as we become more and more Christ-like. So this is an opportunity for you to spend a little bit of time with the Lord, committing to being honest and to seeing what he has for us in this journey. Can you stand with me as we sing together?